Hello and welcome everyone to our briefing, Financing Inclusive Clean Energy Investments in Rural America. I'm Dan Brissett, Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. The Environmental and Energy Study Institute was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. More recently, we've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. ESI provides informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage of climate change topics in briefings, written materials, and on social media. All of our educational resources, including briefing recordings, fact sheets, issue briefs, articles, newsletters, and podcasts, are always available for free online at www.eesi.org. The best way to stay informed about all of our work is to subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Our briefing today is the first in a series about existing federal programs that deliver multiple climate benefits. There is a lot of discussion in Washington about the new policies and investments we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% based on 2005 levels by 2030, which would be consistent with the US commitment under the Paris Agreement. And count us at ESI among those who want to see those policies and investments enacted yesterday. But while we're working on that and implementing the in, in, and implementing, excuse me, and implementing the latest provisions from the bipartisan infrastructure law, let us take a moment to look across the federal government and notice all the good work already underway. Today, our focus is the Rural Energy Savings Program, which is administered by the Rural Utility Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Our panelists will describe RESP and the clean energy projects it facilitates across rural America. But RESP is not alone, not by any means. There are also a number of high impact energy efficiency programs at the Department of Energy and a network of landscape conservation cooperatives supported by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and myriad efforts across agencies to make climate adaptation programs, funding, and data accessible to states, local governments, and communities. If you've not yet signed up for this entire series, which will run through next month, visit us online at www.eesi.org forward slash briefings and RSVP today. EESI is a longtime fan of RESP. ESI has helped many rural utilities secure RESP loans and design equitable on-bill financing programs for energy efficiency, renewable energy, and electrification upgrades. I'll leave it to our panelists to fill in the details and explain how RESP facilitates these investments in rural areas uh, for clean energy. But before I welcome our panel, I would like to introduce Representative James E. Clyburn, who represents the 6th District of South Carolina. In addition to being Majority Whip, and the third ranking Democrat in the U.S. House of Representatives, and according to former President Barack Obama, one of a handful of people who, when they speak, the entire Congress listens. Representative Clyburn is also the clean energy and rural issues leader who is the driving force behind RESP. From the very beginning, right up to today, it is a terrific privilege for me and ESI to welcome Representative Clyburn to our briefing today. Hello, everyone. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak with you about the present need to make energy affordable and accessible to all communities across our nation. Resources such as electricity and broadband are critical to our everyday lives. There should be no barrier to obtaining these necessities. I have heard gripping personal stories from people in my congressional district having to choose between paying their energy bills or putting food on the table or even having to buy medications they need to stay well healthy. Rural families have explained to me how they face higher costs because their homes lack proper insulation, which they compensate with excess heating and cooling. For example, a constituent of mine, Alicia Smith from Orangeburg County, lived in a double wide mobile home with inefficient and obsolete utility systems. Her energy bill averaged more than $400 a month. Alicia's story and many others inspired me to introduce the Rural Energy Savings Program Act. I recognize the need for partnership between the federal government and rural electric cooperatives to address and produce and reduce the energy burden of rural households. I have seen the benefits of the Rural Energy Savings Program. In South Carolina, it has provided essential funding 
to the Help My House program, which has leveraged approximately $1.3 million to reduce the energy burden of 159 households in my district alone. The success of the program led me to include an additional $200 million for the program in the House Pass version of Build Back Better. These additional resources will allow the program to reach more homes and help more people. Programs uh, like the Rural Energy Savings provide a roadmap for how the federal government can partner with rural communities and others to provide much needed assistance to lower energy costs for the vulnerable. The recently passed Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is another example of the work we're doing here in Congress to mitigate the effects of the climate crisis. Federal investments in public transit, particularly in rural communities, will help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. $65 billion has been allocated to upgrade our power infrastructure by building res resilient transmission lines to facilitate the expansion of renewables and clean energy while also keeping costs low. The new law, new law also funds the development and employment of innovative clean energy technologies to help move us to a zero emission economy. Our efforts in Congress are aided by the great work of groups like the Environmental and Energy, Environment and Energy Study Institute, and I'm thankful to our partners like you to help inform good energy policy. I look forward to continuing working with all of you to create more energy efficient society and providing the resources needed uh, for these overlooked communities. Well, thank you, Representative Clyburn, for sharing your heartening and inspiring remarks with our audience today. Um, it's very, very generous of you to join us. We know you have lots of things going on. And I'd just like to also say many thanks to your excellent staff for their advice and assistance in the lead up to our briefing today. Let me remind everyone that we will have some time for questions after our panel, and we will do our best to incorporate questions from our online audience. If you have a question, uh, you can send it to us via email, and the email address to use is ask, A-S-K, at EESI.org, or uh, you can follow us on Twitter uh, or other social media platforms at EESI online, but if you use Twitter, you can send us in a question that way too. Let me introduce our first panelist today, Bob Coates currently serves as an Acting Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Electric Program in the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Rural Utility Service. He is an electrical engineer with a master's degree in the Administration of Science, Technology, and Innovation. Bob has also worked in electric utilities, cable television, IT consulting, and home building. Bob, welcome to our panel today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. I actually cannot start my video. And let me tell you, it's a little daunting going after Congressman Clyburn. But thank you, John Michael, Miguel, Dan, and everyone at EESI for setting up this webinar and also inviting me to speak. I am honored, actually, to be part of this discussion. Next slide, please. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the, the Rural Energy Savings Program in general. Um, and then also some specifics. I'm, I'm not going to go into a deep dive on this because most of you have already heard about the program, but I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the current events and things that are going on. Uh, but it's, it's a relatively new program that started with the Agricultural Act of uh, the Farm Bill of 2014. It's morphed a little bit over the years, actually quite a bit, to the point where we now issue uh, something called a Notice of Solicitation of Applications um, in uh, annually, uh, it, with the exception of this year, because we have not gotten a, uh, an appropriations bill yet. Uh, so uh, we're dealing with just continuing resolutions. The, uh, the program is still open based on the NOSA from FY 2021. Next slide, please. So this is a RESP overview, and again, I just want to give you a very, very quick overview of the program itself. It is a relending program where RUFs, um, under the RESP program, uh, lends to an eligible borrower, we'll talk about that in a minute, and that eligible borrower then relends to what we call a qualified consumer, which is a consumer that's identified by the eligible borrower. 
our uh, funding is zero uh, percent interest for up to 20 years it's really 10 on a payback but the loan program is for 20 years to the eligible borrower the eligible borrower then relends that funds for uh, eligible activities as we call it um, at up to five percent for uh, up to 10 years next slide please So who can be a REST borrower? Uh, it's any power district, you can't see me. Um, anyway, um, for some reason, as I say, I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, show you my video. Um, but uh, a REST borrower can be anyone within our typical FFB, uh, what we call our FFB infrastructure loan program. There we go. Um, where we have we spend uh, or allocate approximately six million six billion dollars a year for electric infrastructure across the co-ops across the country or an entity primarily owned or controlled by one of those entities or uh, new in the 2018 farm bill uh, any uh, corporations states territories etc that provide or propose to provide uh, energy energy storage or energy conservation measures and related uh, services, improvements, financing, or relending. This would also include green banks. Next slide, please. So the program profile is as of FY 2021, we have 31 approved loans that range in size from $150,000 to approximately 50 million. There is no upper or lower limit to RESP uh, at this point. Average loan size is just less than 7 million as of now. Um, and we do have a lot of approved loans, uh, not only for uh, energy efficiency, but also for renewable energy. We have one, manu uh, one full um, loan for manufactured home replacement, which is a big deal for us. And we're hoping to see some really good things out of that this year. Uh, FY22 funding is currently in excess uh, of $200 million. So we have that at least $200 million available. Next slide, please. Wanted to give you a snapshot of the list of eligible activities. This is directly out of the regu regulation. Um, I don't want to talk about this too long more. I want to talk about uh, this in general, but the most important part of this is number 15, which is other approved activities investments directly related to energy efficiency implementation. The important thing there is, uh, this is a fluid document, it's a fluid program. Uh, we did not two years ago have the ability to lend REST funding for EV chargers. And now uh, it is likely to be a, a very, very uh, significant focus of RESP in, in the coming years. Next slide, please. So some of the popular RESP eligible activities are building envelope improvements, windows, doors, insulation, et cetera. Um, HVAC upgrades and replacements, especially in manufactured housing. Um, but this is a, a significant and relatively easy um, project that can be done uh, to reap a, a fairly significant energy efficiency benefit. EV chargers, battery storage, solar and other clean energy projects uh, both on and off the grid are also uh, an important part of the program at this point next slide please so this is actually language from the consolidated appropriations act of 2021 since we don't have one for 2022 but what this does is it gives you information showing that the in these appropriations bills we've actually made adjustments to rest um, these are uh, these adjustments are only available for the length of the appropriation. Uh, we hope that these will actually be incorporated into the Farm Bill or some other act um, going forward. But we take advantage of these when we have the opportunity. And that would be, um, for instance, if if there are systems out there, and and certainly within the co-op world there are um, that um, that meet the rurality statute in in some areas but not in others. This provision allows uh, those particular borrowers to, uh, to, to include their REST program throughout the entire service territory. 
And this is also where we're allowed to, uh, to loan for the replacement of manufactured housing units, uh, which is, as I say, is, is just in its infancy, but we hope will be, uh, will be utilized more and more as time goes on. The FY 2021 budget authority, budget authority being an important term, is $11 million and available until expended. People ask all the time what this means. Let's talk about that in the next slide. So what makes up a REST budget? And really, what is budget authority? What is the subsidy rate? And how is it all calculated? Budget authority is not the actual budget. It is government cost, not necessarily the amount of loan funds that are available. So government costs include uh, the cost of capital, because this is a zero interest program. Uh, and even the treasury rate is higher than zero at this point, even, even though it's fairly low. Uh, that is the cost of capital that it costs the government to actually run a program like RESP. Um, operational costs, which is fairly low as well, because we only have a couple of part-time employees, myself and, and, and one or two others, that actually run this entire program. And also the delinquency rate for the loans that we have outstanding. And I am very, very happy to say that our delinquency rate for RESP is, was, and has been zero. We have not had a late payment. We've not had a delinquency at all throughout the entire process of this program, which is wonderful as far as we're concerned. So the, uh, the amount of budget that we actually have available is the budget authority, which in this case was 11 million for 2021. Um, and divided by, by the subsidy rate. Oh, I also want to talk about uh, the budget authority is actually broken into a couple of different uh, pieces. Um, fiscal year funding, which is funding for one uh, or, or a, a specific number of years. Congressman Clybert actually talked about 200 million in the Build Back Better bill. That would have been stretched out over a 10 year period. Okay, so fiscal year funding is if we got uh, that 11 million for just FY 2021. But if you remember, it said available till expended which means it's no year money. And, and we are actually allocated that funding until we spend it or Congress can sweep it back, but they have not done that to this point. So that again, getting back to the, uh, the budget calculation, it is the budget authority divided by the subsidy rate. Our subsidy rate for REST has run up until this year, has been running in the 12 to 14% range, okay? Let's assume it's 10, and let's assume it's $10 million that were allocated. So you divide the $10 million by 0.1, 10%, and it actually means that we have $100 million to, uh, to loan out for that particular year. The, the no-year money carries over from year to year. Uh, the budget gets transferred back into, using the subsidy rate, back, back into budget authority, that's added to the budget authority that's being, that's being allocated for that particular fiscal year, and then that rolls up into the budget for, for each year. I mean, currently we have in excess of $200 million available for REST right now, even without the, uh, the continuing resolution. Next slide, please. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some success stories that we have from our borrowers. This is Umatilla Electric, which is a small cooperative in Eastern Oregon. Uh, they originally had an energy efficiency program over about 10 years from 2009 to 2018. They made 23 loans at 5% interest. When they implemented RESP in 2019, um, they, uh, their energy saver loan exceeded $500,000 for well, for 2021, and a million dollars since January 19. So more than 100 members have received loans at about 2% for mostly weatherization projects. Their on-bill financing, which is a requirement within uh, the REST statute, they all, it allows them to, uh, to utilize uh, member information as far as credit, et cetera, uh, to, uh, to allow easier qualification for their loans. 88% of their loan applications are approved, um, and, and, if, and they have other ways to, uh, to approve them uh, as well. 
But what's interesting is, and again, it gets back to the delinquency rate within RISP itself. Currently, and I just checked last week, they have no member loan defaults since they began the program. It's, it's great because it gives folks the opportunity to actually reduce their electric bill while they're paying off these particular projects. Next slide, please. Okay, let's jump all the way across the country down to where the next the neighboring state to Senator or to Congressman Clyburn, and that is PD Electric, which is uh, there's a PD in North Carolina and also one in South Carolina. This one's the one in North Carolina, um, and this uh, this slide shows you a, a screenshot of uh, the software program that uh, that the automated meter reading information provides. And I'm hoping you can actually read this um, because I'm not, I'm, I'm showing, yeah, I'm showing it. Okay. Uh, a description of the, the energy efficiency project, the REST project for this particular homeowner is metal ductwork, which means what was done, a contractor came in and reattached and probably insulated the metal ductwork under a manufactured home. Okay. What, the upper right corner shows is the, um, the kilowatt hours per degree day of improvement. And long story short, that shows the percentage reduction in their energy usage over time. And that's 38 and change percent. So you can imagine what a, uh, a home with limited means, uh, what a reduction of, uh, of, of an energy bill in, in the order of 38 to 40 percent. Would, would do to them. And realize Senator or Congressman Clyburn uh, talked about uh, a $400 bill. We hear regularly of people, again, this is in North Carolina, uh, that have bills at, the, at summer and winter in the order of $700. So 40% of, of, let's say $400 is still on the order of $160 a month, which provides a lot of extra food and or gas uh, for a particular family. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to wrap up by giving you some energy efficiency benefits uh, from three different perspectives, okay? From the consumer perspective, obviously there's reduced energy costs over time and, and also an increase in quality of life. If, if you're living in a, in a dwelling that is drafty, uh, has uh, has poor or or broken windows, doors, poor insulation, etc. Um, the inclusion of that, with the ability to do it over time, truly increases the quality of life for the dwell for the, uh, the those dwelling in that uh, uh, in that unit. Uh, from the cooperative's perspective, it helps to reduce the actual peak load on the system. Uh, peak power is very, very expensive. Uh, I, I have a house on the Northern Neck electric co-op system um, and very Eastern Virginia. And, um, and it gives us the opportunity to, uh, to reduce uh, our energy costs, but the peak can be up to $3 per kilowatt hour. So uh, another piece of it from the cooperative standpoint is to reduce infrastructure costs. If you can reduce that peak, that means you don't have to push as much power down the line. You don't have to have to update it as often. Um, to the society, it is the opportunity to improve decarbonization through energy efficiency measures, because in reality, uh, it, it, the coal uh, is about 30% efficient. If you can reduce that by one kilowatt hour and effectively you've reduced um, the, uh, the carbonization by three times that amount. And it also reduces impact on social programs, uh, provides, uh, providing energy assistance, uh, healthcare, and also uh, schools. Kids that are, that are more healthy uh, have more of a, of a propensity to actually go to school. Um, I, I yield back my time to you, Dan. I'm done. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Um, that was a, a really excellent way to kick off the panel. And um, for folks in our audience, um, you were just um, uh, you were just given a very concise overview of a program that can get a little complicated. So if you want to go back and revisit any of Bob's slides, thankfully everything will be posted online at www.esi.org. Um, you can also go back and watch his presentation again. 
Um, RESP is a great program, but the explanation you just heard about credit subsidy and budget authority, um, all that stuff was gold. So it's a great way to kick off the panel. And now we will hear from Doug O'Brien. Uh, Doug O'Brien is the president and CEO of the National Cooperative Business Association, CLUSA International, uh, where he works with the cooperative community, both domestically and internationally, to deepen its impact on individuals and communities. NCBA CLUSA is the primary voice for cooperatives in the United States that use the cooperative business model to empower people in their businesses and communities. Previously, Doug uh, led the work of the White House Rural Council and served in top positions at USDA Rural Development. Doug, I'll turn it over to you. Dan, thank you. And thank you to the entire uh, EESI team. It's, um, it's, it's great to be part of this conversation. Uh, wonderful presentations already by Congressman Clyburn and Bob. And, and I'm looking forward to, to the presentations uh, from, from my other colleagues here. Uh, so much so that I'm, I'm going to be pretty brief. I just want to make a couple, uh, a couple points with a few slides here. Uh, about um, setting a little bit more context. So uh, the two points I'll be making are, are going to be, you know, why cooperatives and just a little bit more about what are cooperatives. And then I want to follow up on, on that last point that Bob made in, in a point uh, that the congressman made so eloquently on, on what rest can really mean in terms of the quality of life uh, for rural households, and in particular, low-income rural households uh, as Dan mentioned NCBA CLUSA is the apex association for all kinds of co-ops here in the United States. So in, in our association, we have rural electric cooperatives, we have agriculture cooperatives, food co-ops, worker co-ops, housing co-ops, et cetera. And, and our job is to advocate and promote uh, for the cooperative business model. And, um, and let's talk about the, the, the just set a quick context on co-ops here in the United States, you on the screen there, uh, a number of data points. I'm just going to point to the ones over on the right-hand side there. In the United States, there's uh, maybe 65, maybe 70,000 establishments uh, that are cooperatives, cooperatively owned. I'm going to talk a little bit more just what does that mean, but I want to talk about electric co-ops. Uh, they power uh, about 20 million homes, schools, and businesses across the United States. So co-ops are not a, a, a marginal idea. They really have gone to scale for rural electrics, for agriculture, uh, for credit unions, and in and, and other places. In fact, so much so that one out of three people in the United States are a member of a co-op. And next slide, please, Dan. So, you know, co-ops are, uh, they're, they're businesses that are owned and controlled by the people who use the business. Uh, in the case of rural electric cooperatives, those are consumers, they're households, they're businesses, they're farms in rural places. They are the members of the business. And uh, through a democratic process, democratically elected board, these, these rural electric co-ops are, are controlled by the people who use them. And then, um, and they benefit the people that use them. And, and, you know, what are those benefits of cooperative ownership? First, they they, they meet needs that many times private markets and government programs uh, don't meet. So they're solution machines that otherwise, uh, you know, that, that the public and private sector is not meeting. We, we see data that co-ops tend to survive uh, at a greater rate, you know, over a longer period of time um, because co-ops have a longer vision. They don't have a, uh, um, you know, sort of a, a, a financial quarter uh, type of horizon. They're looking at the long-term interest of their members, given the nature of the entity. Uh, we also see that the co-ops, they, they have a, a better uh, economic multiplier in, in local economies. It makes a lot of sense because the people uh, who own and, and get the benefit of those co-ops um, are there, right there in the community. So obviously you're going to get better community impact uh, relative to, to firms that are uh, owned and controlled by outside entities, outside investors, et cetera. And finally, co-ops give people who, who use and benefit, um, you know, from that service or from that good, they give them a voice. Uh, they give them an opportunity to, you know, really participate in the business in a meaningful way, given uh, that democratic governance. So next slide, please. Just a few numbers. You saw one already. There's 20 million businesses and households that are served by rural electric co-ops. There's more than 900 rural electric cooperatives across 
the country, uh, make huge uh, contributions to local economies, uh, contribute $88.5 billion nearly uh, to the U.S. GDP annually. So uh, just a, a few numbers there. You can check those numbers out later um, as, as we've already posted those uh, PowerPoints. Next slide, please, Dan. All right, so you saw some numbers. I like maps. Take a look at this map. Who, you know, who and where are served by rural electric co-ops? 56% of the nation's landmass. Um, you know, certainly up through the spine of, of the country, but almost all of it. And then um, as you move towards the coast, some some significant coverage, but not not as universal. But um, but you know, really uh, a significant coverage by these member-owned uh, utilities. Next slide. So th this is a, an important one, and I'm hoping that the next slide, at least on, on mine, Dan, the, oh, there it is, here it comes. Oh, that's interesting. It's switching back and forth there for me. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll make the point very quickly. You know, imagine these two uh, really important maps come together, that electric co-op territory that we've already seen, and then the high poverty territory. And you'll see that there's a very, significant overlap. Uh, that is, most of the high poverty counties in the United States, the vast majority are rural, and the vast majority of those counties are served by rural electric cooperatives. Why is that important? Next slide, Dan. Okay, just a couple data points here that I want to dig into. Uh, you know, the, the energy burden as a percent of household income. The national rate, about 3.3% of, of, of uh, household income goes uh, to the electric, elect, electric bill. In rural, it's about 25% higher, which is a lot, right? So that's 4.4% that's of that household income. And then low income is, is nearly three times, two and a half, three times the national average uh, for, the, for the energy burden. And that's, that's at 9%. And we know, and we, we've heard already some specific examples from Congressman Clyburn and, and Bob, that, that that number can be a lot higher for some households, particularly those, uh, we, you know, there's data that shows that, that older people, uh, that BIPOC communities, um, that uh, renters, and, and those who live in manufactured housing, you know, that, that percentage of their income can go well over 9, 10, in, into the double digits. Now those are just numbers, but what does that, you know, what does that mean? Those are dollars, particularly in these low-income households, those are dollars that are competing for food. They're competing for perhaps medicine in the household. They're competing for, you know, some fees uh, around, you know, some type of educational opportunity. They're competing to put the gas in the car or to make sure that, that you know, a late model um, uh, automobile can be maintained. And, and kept up. And so, you know, so that so folks can get to their job and to school and to the hospital, et cetera. I mean, the, these are real world things that, that uh, Congressman Clyburn talked about earlier. And that's why I get really excited about this program because I, I and, you know, many of us, uh, I'm sure on, on this uh, webinar today, we, we've thought of, you know, what are the tactics that can really move the needle for rural households uh, in terms of increasing their quality of life, and in particular uh, for those households that have low income. And, and RESP is, is one of the most effective tools, in, in my opinion. Next slide. So I'm, uh, Bob covered this. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Dan. That was just a, a summary of how it works, but Bob did an excellent job at that. Look forward to hearing from others and look forward to the questions and the conversation. Thank you for the opportunity, EESI, and, and, um, and my colleagues here. Well, thank you, Doug. And um, you thank the entire ESI team, and I probably should thank the entire NCBA Inclusive team, um, especially uh, Kate Latour, who's been so helpful to us um, on, on all things RASP. So thanks again for your presentation, and thanks for uh, all of your support for um, RASP and a nice working relationship with the ESI that goes back many years. Um, if you have questions in our audience today, as a reminder briefly, there are a couple ways you can ask them. One, 
you can send us an email and you should send the email to askask.esi.org. You can also follow us online on Twitter at EESI online and you can send us in the questions that way and we'll do our best to incorporate those questions into our discussion with all of our panelists after our fourth speaker. But that brings me to our third speaker today. Uh, Denise Abdul Rahman is an Energy Democracy Fellow for the National NAACP Environmental Climate Justice Program. Among her many responsibilities and interests, Denise supports the NAACP's Equitable Clean Energy Initiative, its Power Up Clean Energy and Jobs Initiative, its uh, Black Green Pipeline Initiative, and its Just Transportation and Equitable Goods Movement. Denise advances equitable clean energy policy and practices that ramp up minority and women business enterprises and give them a fair chance. She holds a bachelor's degree in management, an MBA in healthcare management, and a health informatics designation from Indiana University School of Informatics. And she was a podcast guest in season two of the Climate Conversation. So be sure to check that out. Denise, I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, uh, Dan, and to EESI and my distinguished panelists. Uh, I uh, would just like to share some nuances uh, around this very important topic. Uh, I first want to start with that the NAACP has uh, 2,500 branches across the uh, U.S., which uh, obviously includes rural communities. In fact, our leadership and president uh, and CEO, Derek Johnson, uh, lives near and around some of those areas. Uh, we are embarking on 113 years uh, as of February 12th of the existence of our organization. And our program, the Environmental Climate Justice Program, is about 12 years old. Uh, however, we have resolutions on energy, climate, and conservation that go back uh, to the 1970s, uh, since the uh, time of the energy crisis. Uh, some of uh, how I want to present is always human-centered and just noting that we believe that energy is a human right, so no one should die from the cold or uh, of the winter, and, and nor should they uh, die from the heat uh, from the summer. Uh, and just uh, visually here, this is our uh, chairwoman, uh, Kathy Eglin, who lives in Mississippi, who recently deployed uh, solar on her home and also uh, made her house uh, a climate um, efficient home. Uh, she has uh, all the energy efficiency and all the different things to make uh, her home uh, resilient uh, to the impacts of climate. Um, in addition, um, she's just an example of, uh, there's a report uh, that came out from uh, ACEEE that indicates how Americans living in rural areas spend a disproportionate uh, high share of their income on their energy bills. And rural households have a median energy burden of 4.1%. Uh, 4.4% compared to the national uh, burdens of 3.3%. And rural low-income households are even worse off, shouldering a median energy burden almost three times greater than the burden by their higher income uh, counterparts. Other rural residents hit hard include elderly, non-white, renting households and those living in multifamily or manufactured homes. Uh, the problem is most glaring in the east and in the southeast. About 41% of the households in rural areas have incomes below 200% of the federal poverty level, compared with roughly one third of the households in urban areas. And for example, African American rural households are three times as likely to live in substandard housing as other rural residents. Uh, the historical lack of affordable and adequate housing options in rural communities uh, fuels uh, many, uh, many challenges. And then, uh, so I've just highlighted a little bit about uh, our advocacy, uh, the inter high energy burdens, and then just a little around climate. 
Um, our, according to our NAACP lights out in the cold report, uh, states that uh, nationwide have annual temperatures that have been rising over the last 50 years. The hottest parts of the country include Texas and the Southwest and Florida have already experienced large increases in extreme heat days, 90 degrees, 95, 100. And extreme heat when paired with rising humidity levels makes blistering hot days more dangerous. Um, and uh, this heat uh, is increasing over the next uh, decades. And the heat is already the number one weather-related killer in the United States, triggering asthma, heart attacks, and other serious health impacts. Uh, and so uh, reducing one's energy burden, making the energy efficient housing, honing into clean energy uh, is a uh, advocacy or something that we need to do in a fierce urgency of now in order to save lives. Uh, then as we speak to um, moving uh, the money, uh, one, this is a model of uh, training in Evansville NAACP, uh, modeling the training of building solar and partnering with several different uh, partners. And as we think about the moving of the money that yes, there are many job opportunities, opportunities for just transition in this clean energy space, wind, solar, geothermal and energy efficiency, which energy efficiency is the highest growing industry um, in this clean energy realm. And also we do not wanna forget electric vehicles and the placement of their charging stations equitably uh, in, um, in disadvantaged uh, communities. Uh, we appreciate the Equity Commission that uh, will advise the Secretary of Agriculture by identifying the USDA programs and policies, systems and structures and practices that contribute to barriers to inclusion or asset, assets, access and systemic discriminations or exacerbate or perpetuate racial and economic health and social disparities. This is a keen opportunity to ensure that uh, the rural energy savings program funding and the infrastructure funding and the Build Back Better uh, soon to be funded program uh, make their way to these disadvantaged communities. Uh, we need accountability to ensure uh, that the low interest capital makes its way to communities that need it economically for their ability to be resistant to the impacts of climate and to support their ability to thrive so that they can work, play, and worship. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Denise. It's great to see you today. I really appreciate your presentation. Um, and as a reminder, um, uh, if you want to go back and revisit uh, Denise's remarks, or if you want to go back and revisit any of the slides, either from Denise or any of our other speakers, everything's available online, www.esi.org. Um, also, uh, Denise and Doug both mentioned a study by ACEEE. That, of course, is the American Council for Energy Efficient Economy. Um, their uh, rural report is a, a resource that um, um, I think we turn to all the time. And uh, if you are interested in a little bit more about where those energy burden numbers come from, you really, you really can't go wrong by visiting um, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. They've done really, really good work on that topic. Our fourth and final panelist today is Travis Neal. Travis is a certified public accountant and the head accountant at Orcas Power and Light Cooperative, which serves the San Juan Islands in Washington State. Travis was instrumental in three successful Opalco applications to RESP, totaling $47 million. The Switch It Up program at Opalco, or Opalco is on the leading edge of equitable on-bill financing program design for beneficial electrification, on-site solar, battery storage, electric vehicle charging, and community solar. Uh, Travis joined Opalco in 2015 when he, moved us, when he moved to Orcas Island from Seattle with his wife and son. Travis, welcome to our briefing today, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Dan. Can you all see my screen okay? I just want to double check that we can see it. I can see it and I can hear you just fine. Great. 
Well, yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, thank you, John, Michael, Miguel, everybody at EESI. Um, you'll see more why I have a lot of reasons to thank you all at EESI. Um, I've loved these great presentations so far, and it's an honor to be here and be included uh, among all these great presenters. Wonderful lead in from Congressman Clyburn and great overview of the REST program from Bob. Uh, I really appreciated hearing all of that. So I'll lead into a little bit about Orcas Power and Light Cooperative. Uh, as Dan mentioned, we're a rural electric utility that's taken advantage of the REST program and it has done a lot of great things for us. And so we'll review some of that. Just a little bit of background about us. We have been an electric utility since 1937, serving San Juan County in Washington State. You can see a few of the images here. We are very rural, uh, sort of isolated as well, county off the coast of Washington, sort of northwest of Seattle, you can see. And we're very small. Bob mentioned Umatilla was a small cooperative. We are maybe a tiny cooperative then. We've got 15,000 meters, 238 gigawatt hours purchased. Uh, power in 2021. And since 2015, we have had a for-profit broadband subsidiary that sort of piggybacked off of our own uh, fiber optic backbone grid, connecting our own grid together with smart devices. And one of the unique challenges of our service territory being very rural, um, we also have 15 distribution submarine cables and 10 transmission submarine cables, which increase the cost of our power quite a bit. Um, those are very expensive infrastructure to lay in and replace. Uh, and they do last a while, but they cost a lot when, when we do have to replace them. So that's a little bit about us. And, and so because of that reason, you know, Opalco was hungry for a program like RESP. And when it finally came along, I think we were one of the first to jump on the opportunity because it was exactly where we were trying to go with our utility, uh, you know, having having a fiber optic broadband subsidiary just a few years earlier, uh, we were really going down this road of figuring out how we can embrace beneficial electrification, resiliency in our community, also help our community out. Um, San Juan County happens to be of the 3,060 counties in the United States. I think the last data I have from the Economic Policy Institute is we're number 37 in income inequality. And what that means is there are a lot of wealthy high income folks out here. You can sort of see how there's a lot of waterfront available, um, but that also means there's a lot of poverty here. And we're not a persistent poverty county, but because of that, we're a high tourist location and there's a lot of working class folks um, that, that the utility can really benefit by sort of being an instrument of change and benefit to their, to their life. So we'll talk about the Switch It Up on Bill financing program. And, and so Opalco were turning 85 years old this year in 2022, it took 82 years for us to start on bill financing and we did that with the help of rest but as i said we were one of the early applicants and received 5.8 million dollars initially to begin our on bill financing program and at that time i realized okay now we've we've got to have an on bill financing program what do we do now and i actually googled uh, just how to create a non-bill financing program. And that's how I found EESI and got in touch with John Michael and Miguel and with their help and collaborative efficiency, we were able to design a really awesome on-bill financing program that since 2019 now has, uh, as you can kind of see, we've financed over 220 energy efficiency projects for our members for over $2 million appetite is high. That initial $5.8 million is going fast. It's going to be gone before we know it. Um, and so since then, we've applied for and been successful in, and now we have around 47 million aggregate of REST funds available. And with that, we're really, really excited to expand our programs. We started out only financing really ductless heat pumps, heat pump water heaters. Being in the Northwest, we are a winter peaker and folks heating is a large part of their energy cost. 
paired with that, there's no natural gas out here. Fossil fuels are another primary source of heating for a lot of homes. And those are expensive. Propane has to be barged out here. It's not down the road, it, it, you know. So there, there's all these other shipping costs sort of that increase the cost of living uh, in the county here. So electricity, it really is by far the best use of, of heating and, and the biggest impact that we can have by, to lower our members' energy bills overall energy burdens, not necessarily electricity costs, because our, our program was initially focused on beneficial elect electrification. So we're trying to move folks off of propane and onto electricity so they can save money, you know, especially by having a ductless heat pump, heat pump water heaters. These things are all uh, have great impacts uh, in our community. We were, as uh, Bob mentioned, we were one of the few co-ops that we applied for and sort of asked if we could finance sort of the last mile fiber to the premise uh, with an energy efficiency bundle. The way that we saw the demand within our community and the devices that we wanted to finance were in-home battery storage and sense energy monitors and Wi-Fi controllers for the ductless heat pumps that are going in heat pump water heaters. And as we're in the process of changing out our meters to AMI meters, um, we want to have that ability to have that two-way communication with these devices in the future. And due to the limited internet availability in the county, it's really not possible without a, a consistent internet connection. And so the ability to finance the, just that last fiber drop, uh, as, as long as we're pairing it with some energy efficiency measures, that has a huge impact. And now that house is primed for the future of where we're going to go. You know, whether they have just a Wi-Fi controller for their ductless heat pump, whereas in the future they can have a smart EV charging station that can have two-way communications with our AMI meters, and they can be in part of other incentive programs that we'll develop in the future, especially as it relates to in-home battery storage and residential rooftop solar. If we can use those assets, they can benefit as part of these programs. That fiber connection is absolutely critical for greater energy efficiency savings for all our members in the future. Um, and community solar is, is a big piece. I am really excited about that. That's huge. You see a picture of our first community solar array on the screen here. And this was a great project, but one of the things that limited us was that we didn't have a mechanism for low to moderate income members to participate. There was a small carve out of the array that directly benefited uh, low to moderate income members, about 10% of the array. However, if, a folk, if, if our members wanted to invest in that community solar array, they had to pay for that and they had to come out of pocket for it. And in a lot of cases, that's not really applicable um, or it's not a, a, you know, available to them. So, we're in, currently in the middle of building another um, microgrid with a two megawatt community solar array that should be constructed in 2022 here. And I'm really excited to have the ability to on-bill finance community solar subscriptions and at 2% interest. That's, that's one thing I didn't mention about our program is we were able to design the on-bill financing program in such a way that it really lowers our administrative burden and we're able to offer financing at 2% interest um, even though I think initially we had the ability to go up to 3% recently we have the ability to go up to 5% we're still at 2% and it's working okay for us so far um, and we'll see how you know adding new measures sort of changes that but so far we're financing at two, everything at 2% interest over 10 years on the member's power bill and, and they're really able to, as Dan mentioned earlier, pay for these energy efficiency measures while they're reaping the savings. And, you know, hopefully in most cases, we're seeing a net zero impact um, because we are a winter peaker, there's greater savings being reaped in the, in the winter months and maybe less so in the summer months, but overall um, we're seeing uh, having a great impact. And we're, we're also expanding and and financing our first weatherization measures. So we've um, started doing insulation. We've got our first application going through there as well. So it's 
it's been absolutely transformative, as you can see, about what our members can do, the ways in which they can save money, improve their homes. Um, and, you know, as I think Bob mentioned earlier, in terms of defaults, we financed over 220 projects now for 220 different members since 2019. It's been two and a half years and we've had zero, zero defaults now and ever. Um, and, and, and we do have sort of a loss reserve that that's part of the rest program that sort of requires you to sort of make sure that you can um, take, take a small risk. Um, but, but so far so good, knock on, knock on wood. We're, uh, we're doing, we're doing great. Um, so moving on, and this is sort of, we've touched on this a little bit of RESP's impact on the cooperative role. So as I mentioned, Opalco is 85 years old. It took us 82 years to have an on-bill financing program with, which wouldn't have been possible without the, these RESP funds. Although we had a great desire in the community for things like this, and we had a desire within our utility to be able to provide these services to our members. It, it, it also took us 78 years to have a broadband subsidiary. So up until 2015, internet connection was not something that was talked about in our county. So over the last seven years, we've seen a tremendous transformation and our cooperative has really been at the heart of that. And so providing internet connections for folks to work remotely and sort of create a little bit of a middle class in terms of allowing new jobs to be you know, in our county and participate in our community is transformative, transformative in itself, not to mention pairing it with now the energy sort of revolution that we're seeing. In 2021 was another great example why this is all so important to us. In June and July, we experienced a unprecedented long duration heat wave um, in the Northwest, Seattle and our service territory as well, which there were deaths associated with it. And it was not something, you know, these heat waves are not something that we're used to in the Pacific Northwest. And pairing that with a lot of the sort of, there's forest fires coming from British Columbia, Eastern Washington, Eastern Oregon, making the air very, you know, unbreathable and, and deadly in certain cases to, to folks with certain conditions. Ductless heat pumps are a great solution for cooling your house down, and, you know, and, and so air conditioning is something we've never thought about before, uh, really, you know, in our neck of the woods, and, but it, it sure is now. And on top of that, also in 2021, at the end of December, we experienced another long duration, unprecedented cold wave, a, a freezing wave, I guess. I, you know, so I I've grew up in Seattle, um, been in the Pacific Northwest my whole life. And I just remember thinking, I've never seen anything like this out here before. We were in the teens for a week, week or more at a time. And maybe that's one thing at other places in the country, but when your homes aren't equipped for that and your people aren't used to that and we're just not ready to expect it, heating and controlling your energy bill during that heating so you don't have outrageous um, all of a sudden kilowatt hour usage or propane usage uh, was really important. So the changing world uh, and the changing uh, you know, it, it's just something that we're really trying to be prepared for. And RESP is allowing us to position ourselves for the future. And I also wanted to touch on the way that we're able to utilize RESP to increase equity and inclus inclusivity within our community. I mentioned that about with our community solar array, how low to moderate income members weren't really able to participate if they couldn't afford to pay for it in cash. Well, now they can, and you know, so now they can have solar and they can be part of the overall energy community and changing the landscape and, and be, a, you know, be an active member in the change. And, and without rest, it, it just wouldn't be possible without the funding for our on-bill financing program. And so I've seen the co-op change a lot in the last seven years and I, and I you know, in the next five to 10 years, it's, it's gonna continue to change a lot. And, 
the co-op is changing from just providing electricity, basic service to being a more integral part of the community, providing you know other services that are that are absolutely the most important for our, our members' future. Um, and, and obviously, it's been great for for fostering partnerships and lessons learned through REST. We've then now connected with EESI uh, and, and co-ops all across, all across the country. Um, and we're talking about on bill financing programs and uh, innovative ways to use REST funds that, that might be possible now, or maybe we need to ask for you know, permission and, and sort of understand, you know, is this possible within the bounds of, of the REST program? And so we're starting to see that come out and you, that just helps everybody. It helps everybody uh, across the country. It's, it's certainly helped Orcas Power and Light Cooperative. We then have in turn helped numerous cooperatives uh, across the country and have shared lessons learned and best practices. Uh, and it's, it's uh, just a wonderful thing all around. I, I absolutely love the REST program for, for obviously reasons and uh, ESI as well has been pretty integral in making sure that we've got a great design for our on-bill financing program so we can really uh, make the most of the funds that we have available. Uh, and, and with that, I, you know, I just think I want to wrap it up. And I just want to thank everybody again for having me here. It's been an honor uh, and um, happy to participate and, and help other co-ops uh, in, in any way possible if anybody has any questions. So that'll say thank you. And I, that'll be my time. Thank you, Travis. That was a great presentation. And um, thanks especially for helping put all of this in a, in a sort of a practical context of what this looks like on the ground. Um, so thank you very much for that presentation. Um, while our panelists turned their videos back on, um, you heard a couple names um, tossed about over the course of our panel today. One of them you heard was Miguel. That's Miguel Yanez Barnuevo. He is a, a colleague of mine at EESI. You might remember him from uh, co-moderating the um, Green Banks um, and the National Climate Bank uh, briefing last year. You also heard uh, the name John Michael, and that's John Michael Cross. And John Michael will be joining us to lead our Q&A today. Uh, John Michael has been with ESI since 2011. He works on our on-bill financing program, um, our energy efficiency, beneficial electrification, um, and uh, helps folks like Travis um, coordinate with folks like Bob uh, and uh, um, sort of makes the magic of on-bill financing a reality. So John Michael, um, I will mute myself and turn it over to you to lead our Q&A. Thanks so much. Great, thanks Dan. Uh, and uh, thanks to all our speakers. Yeah, my name was thrown around way too much for my liking. Um, but, and I, I've enjoyed working with you all for a, a number of years and honestly, you guys do all the hard work. I just uh, check in with you every once in a while and point uh, people uh, to you to answer the hard questions. So with that, let's get to some more questions. Uh, so I think I want to start off today um, by asking something that honestly a couple of you have already touched on, uh, but it'd be good to dive into it a little bit more. Uh, so two big issues um, for rural America are job creation and broadband expansion. Uh, could you touch on how the issues we're discussing today connect with these important topics? And this question's open to uh, anyone and everyone. John Lightly, you want me to go first? Yeah, well, I, I don't want to take up any more time. I feel like I sort of touched on this a little bit. It was definitely part of our plan, and it is part of our plan going forward. So I'll, I'll leave it to you guys. No, I think you did a great job, Travis. And, and the work that you do is really um, a poster child for what we try to do uh, with RESP. Um, you've done a spectacular job of, uh, of, of turning what was a pretty fledgling uh, program into, uh, into something that, that really is, uh, it, it exonifies what, uh, what it is that I think our, our, our Congressman Clyburn and, and all the others actually uh, intended to do. Um, but getting back to the, the, the focus of the question, John Michael, job creation was, it was certainly a focus uh, under RESP. I mean, it doesn't, again, it's not specific to the eight page statute uh, that is the RESP statute, but clearly it was intended because the goal was to, uh, was to enhance the local economy 
in, in a manner that in, also included energy efficiency. Um, and to that point, um, it was designed to, uh, to provide funding for uh, local tradesmen, um, companies, et cetera, to, um, to, to have the ability uh, to, to do work that's critically important in many of these rural areas um, that otherwise would not have been done because money wasn't available for it. Um, so the opportunity to basically pay over time uh, is very, very critical to, uh, to many of these, uh, these important projects. Uh, as far as broadband expansion is concerned, um, the, the USDA and more specifically rural utility service, uh, in addition to many other programs within uh, the USDA family, um, but the rural utility service has two different areas uh, that address broadband as far as loans and or grants are concerned. Um, one is our, our telecom program, our broadband program, which is frankly the lion's share of funding that, uh, that our rural utility service offers. Uh, it's for, primarily for infrastructure and, uh, and, and, and can be used for, for everything from, uh, from the internet to, to television to, um, to telemetering to whatever. Uh, it's, it's pretty much an open program. Um, must be in rural areas, uh, must provide a, a minimum, and I don't want to say what it is because it changes, but um, in essence, a robust internet um, structure, okay? The, the Rural um, Utility Service Electric Program also has the opportunity to loan for, uh, for fiber, uh, for both for, for the co-op's use and in certain circumstances, as long as we don't try to um, provide loans um, that compete with each other for all intents and purposes. There's more detail than that, but um, at, at this level, we'll stay there. Um, we can also loan up to 15% of, uh, of our electric program funding uh, for infrastructure. RESP, as Travis so eloquently said, um, has a very, very small component to it uh, as an eligible activity for, uh, for uh, fiber drops, all behind the meter and specifically for uh, enhancement for energy efficiency. So we're doing our best and um, the infrastructure bill actually has funding for uh, our, our brethren over in the broadband and telecom uh, programs uh, where um, we're still looking for, uh, for some help uh, with the Build Back Better Act uh, for, uh, for the electric program itself. Hi, this is uh, Denise. I'd like to just uh, state that um, uh, I think it's very important when you have, I think it's millions and millions of dollars that are being um, provided to the various entities uh, to then redistribute those uh, funds. Uh, then there is going to be job creation. And so from our perspective of making sure that things are equitable, diverse, and inclusive, um, I'll just state that according to Blacks and Energy in 2009, African Americans paid $41 billion to the energy sector, but only held 1% of the energy jobs. Um, currently, we hold about uh, 7 to 8% in wind and solar. Uh, and so the idea of this capital investment and jobs being created, uh, we do need to ensure that disadvantaged communities, again, are trained via the Clean Energy Corps or by industry to prepare for this green economic paradigm shift. Um, organizations like uh, mine with the NAACP, we've been focused on building the Black to Green pipeline. We've been powering up jobs, doing demonstration models in Indiana, California, Colorado, to show having partnerships with uh, unions and training uh, institutions. Uh, and, uh, and creating uh, principles around uh, how these jobs need to training need to be deployed, uh, whether it's rural or urban alike, and um, ensuring that the policies and practices line up and ensuring fair chance 
uh, as well for those uh, returning citizens or formerly um, incarcerated. So it can make all the difference uh, in people's lives. And so, yes, this investment in dollars is extremely important. And in regards to broadband, this is slightly connected. In the model we did in Evansville, people didn't have access to internet, especially during the pandemic. Uh, and the libraries had limited um, uh, hours in order for them to access the internet. And so I just cannot imagine that they had challenges. I cannot, cannot imagine someone trying to secure a job and not have broadband access. And so certainly uh, that is uh, keenly important and the jobs uh, that come along with that. Thank you. All right, great. Uh, thanks, everyone. I, what I forgot to do um, when we, before asking the first question is just throw another reminder out to our viewers that you are welcome to submit questions. Uh, you can uh, tweet at us if that is the popular, pop, if that's the right verb to use. Um, uh, and also ask at eesi.org. Um, I think also if you just pop a comment into the uh, YouTube comments. We are watching those as well. And since everyone uh, was very much on time with their presentations, thank you, by the way, we still have quite a bit of time for, for Q&A. Uh, so what makes RESP a good tool uh, uh, to improve equity and environmental justice outcomes, or how could it be uh, uh, used in a way that maybe it hasn't been yet? Again, this is for anyone. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll start, but I think uh, I'll be brief because I, I, I really want to uh, hear from, from uh, Denise and Travis. But I, it, it, and maybe, a, you know, emphasizing um, how RASP can make a difference on, uh, on that quality of life and, and household income for, you know, relatively low income uh, people in rural places. And, you know, I mean, the, the the and and how a, a cooperative can can help a family uh achieve those incomes um you know there's there's many different tactics bob i think mentioned i know he did before the webinar that there there is a carve out for persistent poverty areas uh in resp um so you know that's just a little bit more assurance i think from from the cooperatives in those regions that that USDA is um, is focused on working with those partners, uh, with those cooperatives, um, and then the cooperatives. You know, I think innovators like like Travis. Um, you know, in in this still relatively young program, we're seeing some great examples of of co-ops, and we saw that long list that Robert showed, that Bob showed before, and all the different you know tactics that can be used by a co-op. To help these households, um, I think that's you know it's a the, it's almost you know kind of limitless on on on, on what a co-op might be able to do to help these families. So Denise. Uh, I think, uh, well, one, I mean, the program offers 0% uh, interest. It has favorable 20-year term. Um, I think the opportunity to have an equitable and environmentally just outcome is uh, plausible and can be put in, you know, the, the tool basket of options. Um, However, the and, and of any time you can have someone be able to obtain inclusive on bill financing. So if these utilities receive these funds and then they offer like an inclusive on bill financing program, uh, then I believe that that uh, shifts, you know, uh, access. Uh, to different groups of people that may not normally have access and the ability to uh, make their homes energy efficient or be able to access um, uh, solar uh, on their rooftop or to be able to participate in um, a fair and just model of uh, community owned uh, a form of solar. Uh, so, uh, but certainly the, the resources that are going to these uh, corporations, to states, territories, subdivisions, agencies, municipalities, um, 
people utility districts and to cooperatives and so forth. I think it just depends on whether there's a accountability metric uh, to these entities that are receiving these um, resources. It would be good to create some kind of a guidance document if it doesn't already exist, one that ensures that 40% of these resources go to disadvantaged rural communities. Um, and reserving and setting amount that ensures that uh, certain people who are suffering from high energy burdens, high unemployment, groups that are on the front lines of environmental injustice, that are suffering from the climate changing, are actually obtaining access um, so that we don't have this great energy divide, uh, so we don't further wane people into energy poverty. Um, it is. Uh, possible, I think, also as another option to cooperatives, you know, as if they make, uh, according to a report by Institute of Local uh, Self-Reliance, uh, there's only about 4% of uh, people of color, uh, African-American, that even serve on um, these cooperative boards. Uh, so if these boards were to become more diverse, it could be that more um, thought leadership, diverse thought leadership will also help to ensure that these dollars um, get to uh, disadvantaged uh, communities. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll tack on just briefly. I know I mentioned this a little bit. When we first started our own bill financing program with RAS, we, equity wasn't really consideration of what we thought the impact that we were going to be having. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, we're in the, our county is in the top one to 2% of counties in the country uh, for income inequality. And the statistics are, are interesting and, and they don't tell the whole story because a lot of that income that is there on the other side, that top 1% does not, does not live in our county year round or, you know, or, or contribute uh, as part of the community very often. You know, it's a very much summer homes, uh, perhaps, and, and think vacation rentals or, or things like that occur. So, and, and since we started financing sort of these heating projects in particular, um, because our, our heating bills in the, in the winter time can be quite high, because that is when our we peak, um, you know, I, I'd say even, even last month in January, I had at least two members that I was on the phone with uh, that, that were crying on the other end of the line because they were so grateful that they could finance this ductless heat pump. Both of them ended up being ductless heat pumps because it could save them so much uh, in their power costs uh, every month. And, 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 and as I mentioned, in the Northwest, we are not used to extreme climates in any direction. And in 2021, we experienced extreme climates in both directions, very extreme summertime heat wave and, and very extreme wintertime freezing, which many folks were very shocked with how much kilowatt hours they use and how much that costed. And, and if that's a trend of the future, you know, if, if, if these sort of swings are going to be occurring sort of more frequently every year, then this is more important than ever to get in the hands of the most people possible, especially the people that are living here year round, you know, and, and those are the people that, that need this program. And so it's, it's become a really big part of what we think about when we're thinking about what are we financing, who are we financing it to, what are they able to get, what are the benefits they're going to receive, you know, community solar is a great piece of that. That was, that was very obvious because they didn't have to come out of pocket for this stuff anymore. Um, you know, and 2% interest over 10 years on your power bill, it's unheard of. I can't even think of, you know, and, and with interest rates rising, potentially, this is, uh, it's a huge benefit and, you know, our, our community is absolutely grateful. So I'm speaking for San Juan County when I'm saying thank you to Bob and RUS and EESI for helping us design our program. It's, uh, it's absolutely, you know, it's extraordinary. There we go. Okay. Let me, let me uh, speak in a little bit. Um, I, I think some of the best, um, the best that I've seen as far as um, equity and, and environmental justice are the, the presentations or the, the, the videos that both EESI and ACEEE did 
related to South Carolina. Um, if, if anybody wants a real reason to go to work on every day, and, and trust me, um, those of you that work for the government know that um, it's, uh, it can be a little difficult to work here sometimes. I mean, I run um, customer service, data calls, FOIA requests, all of that stuff in addition to, to RESP. And um, w we become a pincushion for a lot of people um, on, on a daily basis. So when we get positive feedback, like Travis has gotten over the last couple of years or you know, last couple of weeks, um, it's really, it, it's very valuable to, to my staff and myself. Uh, and those videos that were, were put out by both EESI and the AC, ACEEE are, are impactful, powerful, and, and provide, in a nutshell, better than any of us could ever do, um, the, uh, the impact, the positive impact that, that these types of programs have on, on individuals, um, you know, especially in manufactured housing. Um, I'm on a panel right now to, uh, to work to, to expand the government's role in, in the replacement of manufactured housing and finance and all kinds of other issues that, uh, as an engineer, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I didn't focus on until recently. Um, but it's, it, 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 it's really amazing um, how much these poor people have to pay um, because um, they're, in, they're in a situation that they probably didn't get there on their own volition, uh, but either because of uh, health issues or, or something else or the, you know, the whole um, economic situation of 2008, 2009, many of these folks are still there. They'd love to get out, uh, but they're very con uh, concerned and, and frightened, frankly, that they, they don't want, they, they're in a situation now that, that they can deal with. Um, and many of them are very reticent to, uh, to replace a manufactured home, for instance, because they don't want to secure any more debt. So we're all trying to work on ways to improve that, um, and and hopefully we'll come up with a solution that works um, in the next year or two. Uh, so that trans is it, hmm, words not working today. It's okay. I'm only moderating a panel. Uh, so uh, looking ahead to the next few years, this is a question we received uh, uh, transitions from. So what uh, Travis and Bob you were saying. Uh, what trends do you see in rural America that might lead to more opportunities uh, to take advantage of RESP? Uh, any challenges? And then just quash maybe a couple questions together that we've received uh, as well as, and maybe Bob, this is mostly for you, like what all can folks take advantage of with RESP? I, I, you know, there's, there's plenty of eligible measures that uh, um, have, you know, I'm not aware of an application that's been in for yet. It's a pretty wide range. That, um, so. Right, I mean, there's more, you get more ideas in from applicants, uh, rest between doing a lot more things over the next couple of years. Let me answer the last question first. Um, yeah, I mean, Travis and, and numerous other uh, of the RESP uh, borrowers, applicants, and those that are interested in RESP have come in with questions of, you know, can you do this? Can you do that? Um, EV chargers is a big one. Um, I can tell you that there's a huge move afoot, again, with the infrastructure bill, primarily under uh, the guise of DOE and, and DOT uh, to put an electric vehicle charger across a uh, system across the country. Um, we are involved in that because as, as Dan said, uh, and, and Doug as well, um, the, the, the rural footprint is, is way larger um, than the majority of, uh, of the lower 48 and, and also Hawaii and, and Alaska. And we've got interest in both of those states as well. So we're trying to, uh, to utilize RESP funds um, in addition to all the grant funding and everything else that's coming out of um, this, this current administration um, to improve the quality uh, not only of life, um, but also um, the economic quality and everything else that's associated with our rural communities. I mean, that's what the USDA does and, and the Rural Utility Service, especially when it comes to, uh, to the utilities that serve these particular communities. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll jump into that first part of the question, John Michael, on, on, on trends and challenges. Just, just a few quick ones. Um, a couple that have been mentioned already. 
the the increased uh, build out of broadband over the next few years, uh, both in terms of geography and in terms of speed, I think will provide uh, you know a lot of rural regions or a lot of rural co-op regions the ability to do more uh, work around smart grid that they can they can leverage that new broadband that's not not as Bob you know described that that's not financed by RESP, but now they've got this infrastructure and they can leverage that infrastructure to really do some great things using RESP. So I think that that's a great big one. Um, I think the, uh, you know, the, in terms on, on challenge, I'll go ping pong here a little bit. In terms of a challenge, the, the sad fact is that, and I mentioned this before, that, you know, um, I think well over 80, maybe even 90% of all persistent poverty counties are in rural America. Um, with many, many of those being minority majority, uh, Native American, Black, uh, Hispanic, you know, counties. And as, you know, as the country continues to look for ways, for really tangible ways um, to deal with inequality and inequity, uh, I think RESP will be a, a tool that people can, can recognize as one that, um, that can be really effective. And then the last thing I'd say in terms of, of an opportunity over the next few years is I think RESP is starting a snowball effect. Now we know that, you know, RESP now has been around for a number of years and there's some great examples, many of which we pointed to and Travis really brought to life, um, you know, a recent one. But I, I think this is going to be one of these kind of programs that once, um, you know, once the field, and in this case, rural electric cooperatives and other municipalities, see how people are using it. In, in real examples, that it, it's going to go faster and faster, um, and I'm I'm really excited about that. All right, uh, Travis, did you have a final comment? Please go ahead. Oh, I'll just tag on. It's really interesting to me. You know, our co-op's been around since 1937, and you know, for the first 78 years of its existence, it it probably. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is in the last seven years, it's changed so much more than in the prior 78 years where it's just a distribution cooperative providing power. And now the fundamentals of, of what a distribution cooperative is for us now in the community has shifted very dramatically already in the last uh, five, seven years since being able to have a, a broadband subsidiary, which is sort of a trend that you're seeing a lot across rural American cooperatives. And now the REST program is sort of a, a new piece on top of that where, you know, we're able to relend for energy efficiency measures. And so I, I'm seeing that trend as I talk to cooperatives ac across the country and I'm being connected with them through EESI in many ways, sometimes through, uh, through RUS as well. You know, and what I see that, you know, we have to implement what we can do in our own service territory and that's very different than what some other uh, counties or cooperatives are going to be able to do in their own service territory but i think what uh to doug's point is that we can serve as sort of the example and you know we've we've got it we're using it we're trying to be uh, innovative with the ways in which we can use it uh, you know i'm happy to talk to other co-ops and sort of share our success as other co-ops were able to share their success with me. And, and it sort of goes in tandem with on-bill financing program design, as well as innovative solutions to problems that your members are, you know, your members have across the country and they're very different across the country. And, and so we're solving our solutions. But um, I think just now having the examples because the REST program is sort of a, a newer uh, in general, um, being able to see the success stories, the default, the zero default rates for the most part, as far as I know, for anybody. Um, and now with the, the flexibility with being able to, you know, do different creative things that your members want and that you as a utility want to position yourself and, and be for your members. So I just kind of wanted to add that. Thanks, Travis. Um, that's a great way to wrap up. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, John Michael, thank you very much for leading the Q&A, and thanks very much to Bob and Doug and Denise and Travis for four excellent presentations. Um, as a reminder, if you would like to go back or 
this is to our audience. If you'd like to go back and revisit any of their presentations or any of the materials, um, you can uh, access everything by visiting us online at www.esi.org. You can also, and this is kind of in response to some of the folks who have asked some questions that we're not gonna have time to get to today. Um, we actually do a lot of writing on RESP um, and on bill financing and beneficial electrification and electric school bus electrification and all sorts of topics related to this program. So um, in fact, just I think a couple weeks ago, our colleague Miguel published some articles about electric school buses. Um, you can read case studies, including about Opalco um, other utilities, co-ops from around the country. So we have a lot more available on this program because it's a good program. We really, we really, really like it. Um, and uh, we also uh, write a lot about um, things like the solar equity principles that the NAACP published last year that we were um, uh, a big supporter of. So, um, you know, this is in some ways the tip of the iceberg on a small program, but one that just generates an awful lot of good stories. Um, also, like to once again thank Representative Clyburn uh, for his remarks earlier uh, in our session today. Thanks again to his staff for making that possible. It's always uh, great to welcome him into one of our events. Uh, and uh, again, without Representative Clyburn, uh, RESP wouldn't be where it is today. So we appreciate his support. A couple quick plugs. Um, Denise mentioned um, some issues related to the Justice 40 initiative. Um, we've also heard a lot about energy efficiency, manufactured housing, heat pumps, uh, standards and codes, things like that. Those are topics that we'll be taking a look at coming up. So uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll be taking a look at energy efficiency programs administered by the Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Uh, we will also be looking at large landscape conservation, climate adaptation data programs. Um, and then also, uh, I think at the beginning of April, uh, we'll be taking a look at the status of Justice 40. So if you are interested in those topics, um, please uh, stay tuned. The best way, as always, to stay up to date with everything we do is to subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions, and you can do that by visiting us online. Um, you know, we heard a lot of great stuff today. Low-income rural households face a much higher energy burden. It can be three times higher than average, and that's even worse for the elderly and people of color. Uh, lower energy bills, help those households afford other necessities. And it means waste, um, less wasted energy. Um, and that um, energy can oftentimes come from fossil fuels, um, which means that all of this has a big climate benefit as well. Programs like RESP are a critical resource for rural electric co-ops, for example, that provide low or no cost financing and other incentives to their members who lack access to affordable capital for cost-effective energy efficiency and other clean energy improvements. RESP is a great program. It's a great example of an existing federal program that does good work every single day and helps people, households, and communities all across the country. I'd like to take a quick moment to thank everyone at EESI for making today's briefing possible. Thanks to Dan O'Brien, Omri, Emma, Allison, Anna, Amber, Savannah, Miguel, and of course, John Michael. And thanks to our two spring interns, Emily and Grace. The next slide is a survey link. If you have two minutes, uh, please, uh, we would appreciate your response. We know we didn't get to all of our questions today. We did our best. Um, so we'll, um, we, we'll, we'll take that feedback. I'm sure that'll be shared with us in the survey. It usually is. Um, but we read every response and we do our absolute best to make improvements um, in, our, in our programming. If you have ideas, if you had any technical issues, if there was a problem with the web page, please let us know. Uh, we want to make these resources as accessible uh, to as many people as possible. We'll go ahead and wrap it up there. I hope everyone has a great rest of your Tuesday and uh, we'll see you back in a couple weeks for energy efficiency means business. Thanks everyone. Have a good afternoon.